Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Marquardt, and I will be going over the 2020-2021 Special Ed Consolidated Grant application. I am in the Grants Negotiation or Grants Administration Division, and I'm a member of the Grants Negotiation Team. I've been with TEA for about 15 years. We have some panelists from Grants Administration and we also have some program panelists available. I will be addressing questions at the end of this presentation. So if we're not able to get to all the questions, please contact your negotiator so that we can assist you. I will be showing the negotiator region assignment at the end of the presentation so you can see who your negotiator is. Let's begin. So let's go over some ground rules. Um, if you have questions, please submit them using the Q&A feature. And then if you have technical issues, if you can't hear or um, some other technical issue, please use the chat feature. The PowerPoint will be posted on the grant resource page. So you can go to the TEA homepage. In the search box, type grants resources. Select the Grants Resources link, and the presentation is located under the Training section. Okay. okay, today we'll be going over the Special Ed Consolidated Grant Application Federal. Now there is going to be a state application later on around August or September. So this will include IDEA B formula, IDEA B preschool, and IDEA B discretionary deaf. Okay, let's go over some important dates for 2020-21. The SC 5003 formula grants consolidated schedule was released on May 1st and is due on September 3rd. The special ed ADC was released on May 15th and will be due on September 3rd. And the special ed ADC state, we're hoping to release on in August or September. And then for the special ed consolidated grant, the 2021 year, the release date is June 2nd. So it's available now and it's due September 3rd. So if you submit the application on or before July 1st, you'll get that July 1st start date. But if you submit after July 1st, then that becomes the effective um, grant start date for your funds. So we try to warn everybody to not wait until the last minute to submit these because the system gets very busy and then the negotiators get really busy with phone calls. So we want you to get it in as soon as possible so that we're able to assist you and get those in. Okay, so I'm going to go over what we'll be discussing today. Um, the first bullet point that we'll be discussing and then we'll um, talk about applying for the grant. So there's two schedules that we need to complete before you can get to the special ed consolidated grant. And then we'll be going over the schedules you need to complete for the special ed consolidated grant. And then I'll give you some resources and contact information. Okay, so to access TEAL, you'll go to our website, tea.texas.gov, and then up in um, up at the top, you'll see Teal Login, and you'll select that, and it'll bring up the Teal box. So if you need to request a new user account, you'll select um, this, this site here, or if you already have an account, you'll put in your username and password. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, besides the TEAL login, there's also a sign up for updates. 
And if you're not already on the listserv to receive updates about grants, you may want to sign up here. It'll ask for your email address and then you'll sign up for grants um, so that you can get information on any new grants that are available. Um, it's anything about new grants, we'll send you all that information. So it's very important to be a part of that in order to sign up. Um, you have to um, click on this box. And then the grant opportunities page will list all the grants that TEA has available. And that's a very good um, place to go to because you can find out um, if you click on this, um, you'll click on the down arrow and you can see different grants. And then if you go into each of the grants, you'll see um, who's eligible for that grant, the program guidelines, the dates to submit those grants. So it's another great resource is the grant opportunities page for each grant. Okay. And then if you're not sure of your role in eGrants, um, once you log into eGrants, it'll tell your roles, role right under eGrants. This one is grantee official. And then if you need to add or modify your access, you can click on this button. And the superintendent usually has to approve that. So I wanted to go over the roles in eGrants. So the grantee official can delete the draft. You can view, create, edit, save, or submit. Also, um, if you have to delete a draft, the grantee official will need to delete that draft. So that is next to the certify and submit button. And only the grantee official can delete that draft. I just wanted to make that um, you aware of that. And then the grantee manager can view, create, edit, save, and submit negotiated applications. So they can't submit the original application, but they can submit negotiated applications. And the grantee writer can view, create, edit, and save. And then grantee staff, grantee viewer, and ESC viewer can only view. Okay, um, now along, once you get into eGrants, along the top, there's different tabs. And we will be going into the Contacts tab, the Grants tab, and the Special Collections tab. We recommend that first you go into the Contacts tab and enter all the contacts. Now this will be for all three grants, the ESSA, Perkins, and SPED grant. So you'll need to list all of your, um, contacts here. Now this doesn't list their roles. It'll only be their um, contact information. So contacts are not on the physical application. You'll select them from this section that you've um, gone to the contacts um, tab and entered them. And then the drop down to select contacts per grant is listed in the application. So you select them from this list under contacts. And you can update these contacts as needed. An amendment is not required. So you can add down here or edit or remove contacts. But the only thing with this is this will not be effective until you um, complete a new amendment. So if you already have an application in process, it's not going to um, change the information you've already um, certified. So it would just be the information for the next time if you need to change, if you need to edit or remove. Okay. And then a very important thing that we wanted to remind everybody is the SC 5003. This is new for the Special Ed Consolidated Grant. Um, the SC 5003 Formula Grants Consolidated Schedule 
and the GS 2200 applicant designation and certification form must be submitted before you can apply for the special ed consolidated grant. So these two schedules must be completed before you start your special ed consolidated grant. Okay, so now after you've entered all your contacts, you're gonna go over to the special collections tab and you wanna click, click on the special, on the 2020, 2021, SC 5003 Formula Grants Consolidated Schedule, which is right here. So you'll click on that, and only one SC 5003 per LEA is available to submit. So that means for ESSA, Perkins, and SPED, um, you'll have to collaborate with the appropriate LEA staff to complete this schedule because that has to, completed for, has to be completed for all three, um, all three grants, but it's only one schedule. So you'll have to consolidate with those um, members. So once you get into the SC 5003 Formula Grants Consolidated Schedule, the first thing that will be um, in part one is the equitable access and participation schedule. So you'll include um, if you have barriers. If you have no barriers that exist, you'll select the first button and you're allowed to select that for the special education consolidated grant, but we do not ex um, we recommend that with a special ed consolidated grant that there's at least one bar barrier selected, but it, the system will allow you to select no barriers. If you do have barriers, you select the second box, and then you'll come down and you'll select student, teachers, or others. So this down arrow will let, let you select either students, teachers, or others. So you'll indicate whether any barriers exist to equitable access and participation for any groups that receive funds for ESSA, Perkins, or SPED. So you'll do that. If, barrier exi if barriers exist, select student, teachers, and others. You'll do that there. And then you'll add a brief description. And then in the help button and in the instructions button, there's a list of barriers and strategies to overcome those barriers. It's a limited list, so if you need the full list, you can go to last year's application and go to the document library, and then you'll be able to see all the full list if you need that. Another thing is if you have more than one barrier, you can add a line and it'll add a second or third line. I've just showed you here. You can add one for student, teachers, or other. And then if you need to remove a line, you click over to the left side and you click remove a line. Okay. And then the part two has the general guidelines and assurances. So that information is here. You can click on that and go over that information. If you're, and then the part one or line one here talks about if your organization spends non-federal funds on lobbying activities. So if it does, you select yes. If no, then you're done with this section. But if you select yes, you have to um, let us know SPED, or you can choose more than one. And then you have to attach this disclosure of lobbying activities form. Now that attach button is located, um, it's a couple down from the certify and submit button to the left should be able to select under attach. If you click on attach, you can select the 2000, um, 
2020-2021 disclosure of lobbying activities form. Okay. And then we have the specific program guidelines and assurances for each grant, ESSA, Perkins, SPED, federal and SPED state. So it gives you the program guidelines. If you need to review those. And then you'll check the box that you accept and are in compliance with the guidelines. Okay. And then last part three is certification and incorporation. So what you'll do is you'll go to select from the down arrow and you'll select one of your contacts and it has to be an authorized official. And if, if you um, forgot to add a contact, you can select add new contact, but it's gonna take you away from the page and go back to the contacts tab. So it's best to save the form down here before you do that. So um, only a grantee official, well, only a grantee official can certify, can certify and submit the schedule. So you'll need to, um, the submitter information does not need to be completed. Once you click on the certify and submit button after you've selected the contact, contact for the authorized official, you'll need to select the certify and submit button and then this information and submitter information will appear. I know we've had a lot of people who have tried to fill out the submitter information and it will not let them. And that's because that appears after you certify and submit the application. The other thing is if your certify and submit button is not, is grayed out, then please try, remember it's Internet Explorer, and Google Chrome that work best with the system with eGrants. And also remember to delete your history. And I would try to go into eGrants um, from the main link on the TEA website page because we're having a lot of people that um, the certify and submit button is grayed out. We can also, if your negotiator, um, you can have your negotiator help you if for some reason this is grayed out. If you do not complete it, because that doesn't mean it's certified and submitted. So if you have to save the schedule because you have to add a new contact or information, make sure you go back to the schedule and certify and submit the schedule. You should get, get you should get a congratulations that your um, form has been submitted. And I would also go back in and to double check to make sure um, the status is submitted in that application. But remember, I, this is just a very important point that you do not fill out the submitter information that that comes after you certify and submit the application. Okay. And then after you've, we've completed the contacts page or tab and the special collections tab, then we're gonna go to the grants tab. And then we'll select the 2020-2021 special ed consolidated grant. And it should be an available status. Okay. And then once you click on that, the next schedule that we need to complete is the special ed um, ADC or applicant designation form. So that's the next form after the SC 5003 that needs to be completed before you complete the special ed consolidated grant. Okay, so the ADC form um, we have all the funding sources that will appear. Remember, it's IDEA B formula, IDEA B preschool, and IDEA B discretionary death. Now, the other fund sources will appear or be in an application later in August or September. 
And if a funding source does not have an entitlement amount, then it'll be grayed out. So if you don't have idea B discretionary death, this whole section will be grayed out. And then if you need to view your entitlements for each fund source, you can click on this button here and I'll give you a list of entitlements for each fund source. Okay. Okay, so now I wanted to go over the different um, designations for each fund source. So you can select for IDEA B formula, IDEA B preschool, and IDEA B discretionary death, apply on own, apply as a fiscal agent of an SSA, not apply at all, or apply as a member of an SSA. So those are the different designations. And if you're in an SSA, the fiscal agent will need to select apply as a fiscal agent of an SSA. And then as a member district of an SSA, you'll select apply as a member district of an SSA. Now, the important thing to remember is the fiscal agent must submit its ADC form before the member districts can submit their form. That way, the member districts can select them from this section here, designate fiscal agent name. So they can um, choose the fiscal agent and their CDN number. So it's very important that the fiscal agent applies first and then the member districts. Now we're finding a lot of um, the fiscal agent will apply for SSAs, but then they need to um, have all their member districts apply before they'll see their entitlements in the PS, um, the private school form and the budget form. So make sure that they apply and then um, you open up the application to apply for all the entitlements. If for some reason the fiscal agent applies and goes in and completes part of the um, application for the special ed consolidated grant, once the member districts certify and submit their ADC, then they probably will need to save the um, PS 3502 private school form and the budget form in order for those entitlements to show. So all it's very important that once the fiscal agent has completed their ADC, that all the members then go in and complete their ADC for all the entitlements to show. Okay, so once all the ADCs have been completed, if you're an SSA or if you're a independent, then you'll go in and select under grant application the 2020-2021 Special Ed Consolidated Grant Application Federal. Okay. So once you select that, you're going to see the schedules that need to be completed. The first schedule that must be completed before the others are available is a GS 2100 applicant information. Now remember, we wanna have two contacts from your list from the contacts tab and try to make those, um, if they're somewhat knowledgeable about the grant because our negotiators will contact um, the first or second contact to try to get information if they need any information. So they should be somewhat knowledgeable about the grant. But for these other schedules to populate, they have to complete the GS 2100. So they'll select from the down arrow the contacts. The other thing I wanted to mention, which is different from last year, is there's no BS 6300 um, 6, supplies and materials that information will be only in the budget. Since we don't, it's all in remaining 6,300, we do not need a schedule for that. So just so you're aware that 
um, 6300 will only be put in the budget summary, which is different from last year. We will not have a separate schedule for the S6003. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the first schedule that we're going to be going to be going over is the PS3502, which is the private nonprofit school participation form. And if you are a charter school or there's no private schools within your boundaries, then you're going to check one of these two boxes and the form is going to close. You'll not need to complete anything further. But if you are not, if you're an LEA and you have private schools, then you'll need to complete the rest of the form. Part one, you will not complete. Okay. Another thing I wanted to tell you is there's always an instructions button for each schedule. So if you have any questions, you can always contact your negotiator, but also there's information on how to complete each schedule up in the instructions. Okay, so the first um, part that I wanted to go over, there's um, part two and three, which are check boxes mainly. So that's pretty self-explanatory. There's part four. We have an A and a B, and part A is related to formula, and then part B will be related to preschool. So the information that you'll need to fill out for part A in, uh, in A, part four, will be lines two and three. So line two should be greater than line three. And if this is not the case, if you put um, line three greater than line two, it'll give you an error message when you save the application or save the schedule. And line two refers to the age um, three through 21 of special ed students in public schools on the last Friday in October. 2019. So that's what that line is for. And then line three refers to the age three through 21 in private schools on the last Friday in October. So you'll want to put that information in lines two and three. And then I wanted to let you know if um, you do not need to update the schedule as the numbers change, because this is a snapshot date on the last Friday in October 2019. So the only reason you change these um, line two and three is if you reported them incorrectly. So that's for idea B formula. And then we have idea B preschool. Lines two and three are the only sections you need to complete. And lines two should be, line two should be greater than or equal to line three. And the system will again give you an error message if line three is greater than line two. So line two refers to age three through five, because this is preschool, in public schools on the last Friday in October. And then line three refers to the age three through five in private schools on the last Friday in October that you'll put here. And then your entitlement amount for each will be on line one for formula and preschool. And the system will automatically make you change this if an amendment during final amounts, um, if you amend during final amounts to update this amount but you will not need to change lines two and three. Okay. And then part six, services, you have to um, provide a little, a couple sentences regarding how does your LEA determine which private school students receive services. So that's what's gonna go in this section. So also it wants you to describe your consultation process. So an example of that would be, we consult with the private schools and 
we consulted with the private schools and we determined that speech was the greatest need. We will serve private school um, students that need speech services. So that would describe your process and um, also determine who you're going to serve. So that's what you're gonna to wanna to put in this box. And it can be brief, but just a couple sentences and make sure you include um, the stu students you will serve and the consultation process. Okay. And then part seven, we have three different boxes to do, document um, your consultation process. So you can choose more than one option here. You can choose one, two, three, or all three of them. And if you choose the second box, um, this means, so the first box means that consultation occurred and the LEAs um, provided written affirmation. So that would be your first box. The third box was consultation did not occur because the private schools did not accept consultation. So that's your third box. The second box talks about private schools that um, did receive consultation, but they did not um, provide written affirmation. That means they did not provide, um, they did not sign that they received consultation. So what you'll wanna do is there's the attachment button again, which is a couple down from the certify and submit button. You will wanna attach a form if the second button is selected on how you tried to get that um, written affirmation or how you tried to get that signature that they did receive consultation. So um, it could be by fax, by email, so that's what you want to um, state in that attachment is um, you want to say something about we obtain, um, we tried to obtain written affirmation by fax, by email. So um, not, we do not need your process of consultation um, attached. It's just how you went about trying to get them to sign that they did, did receive consultation. So that's what line two is. Um, if that's selected, that's what you'll need to attach. Otherwise, for line one and three, you do not need an attachment. Okay. And then we're going to go, the next schedule is the BS 6001, which is the program budget summary. So this looks a lot different from last year. We have three fund sources, the IDEA B formula, preschool, and IDEA B discretionary death. And this will show your um, final amounts and planning amounts, and then any carryover you'll have. Now, one big change from last year is CIS is no longer on this um, budget schedule that will only be in the BS 6016. And it will not be in the class object codes either. So the only place you'll so show that you're um, reserving funds for struggling non-disabled students is on the BS 6016 schedule. And CEIS stands for Coordinated Early Intervening Services. So we just wanted you to be aware because that's a big change from last year. So you'll probably want to keep documentation for um, if you decide to reserve CIS funds or are required that you keep documentation on which class object codes you're going to use those CIS funds for. And when you're completing the application, you want to just make sure that you keep notes on um, which class object code um, and the dollar amount because you'll have to report for three years on these students. So that's very important to keep some kind of documentation on these CEIS funds if you decide to use those. Okay. So I um, 
wanted to just let you know too that your entitlement mounts are on top and then you'll put the um, amounts by class object code down in part two, the budget summary. So you'll need to complete this before you complete any other schedules. Okay. So if funds are budgeted for class object codes 6100, 6200, 6300, 6400, 6500, 6600, um, the supporting schedules need to be completed. I'm sorry, not the 6300, because that you'll only put the amount on line 63 here because we do not have a schedule for that this year. And if no funds are budgeted for a class object code, like let's say you do not budget any funds for 6200, you'll wanna make sure that you still go in and save the 6200 schedule so that it um, is complete. So even though you don't budget funds, you still have to save the schedule. Okay. And then the next schedule is the BS6101, which is payroll costs. And the amounts at part, in part one will populate from what you put in the budget summary. Okay. For each fund source. And then part two, it states type the number and type of positions. Now for administrative positions, it's not allowable with IDEA B funds, so this section is grayed out. So if funds are not budgeted for formula, preschool, or discretionary DEF, the column will be grayed out. So the whole column will be grayed out if you did not budget funds on the budget summary. And this year, which is different from last year, you do not need to type in the number of positions. You're gonna just check the box for professional staff, paraprofessional, or administrative support for indirect costs. So that's a big difference, and which is great because now when um, amendments, if you're thinking about amending, it's not based on the number of positions anymore. Um, as long as you have a box checked, it'll cover you. So you will not need to amend as often as you previously did. So that's a great, great advantage. Okay. And then, um, as I stated earlier, the admin costs are not allowable, so that's grayed out for all three fund sources. And then for we have part B is for LEA positions and part C is for campus positions. So part B, check the box under the appropriate fund source for the number of positions, idea B formula preschool and idea B discretionary DEF, and same with campus positions for professional staff, paraprofessionals, and then administrative staff, indirect costs. You'll check the number of positions for each fund source, okay? And then part three is for substitutes, extra duty pay, and benefits. Now notice that it says any fund source. So all the three fund sources above, idea B formula, preschool, and idea B discretionary death, if you have anything for school-wide stipends, substitutes, incentive pay, you'll check the box and that'll um, be okay for all three fund sources. So just check the appropriate box for any SPED funding source. So that's part three. And then the last part, part four, is confirmation of payroll requirements. So you'll check the box for confirmation of payroll requirements. Um, and when you do that, it just um, confirms that all positions are aligned to statute. So that's it for part four. Okay, and then we go to the next schedule, the BS6 
um, 201, which is professional and contracted services. Now the schedule looks different than it did from last year. So part one is for rental or lease of building space in buildings or land. And part two is for contracted services that require specific approval. So when you put funds on the budget summary in line 6200, then you'll need to complete this schedule but also your dollar amounts will go under remaining 6,200 that do not require specific approval. So if you do have funds that require specific approval, you're gonna put the amount up on line one if it's for rental or lease of building space, or if you have um, items that require specific approval, it's gonna go on line two. So, any amount that you put in these two lines, lines one and two, it's going to take away from your remaining. So you want to, um, if funds are budgeted on the BS, on the budget 6200, then this schedule needs to be completed. And um, we just wanted you to be aware on the payroll schedule, you only have check boxes, but on this schedule, you're going to have dollar amounts that you're going to enter. So you're going to enter dollar amounts instead of check boxes. Um, the other thing we wanted you to be aware is any remaining budget amounts will display on the line not requiring specific approval. So that's this line. So if you don't have the full amount, um, if you don't want the full amount in lines one and two, the rest will be in remaining 6,200. Okay. And then part three are the items that require specific approval. So we've got a list here of lines one through 27 that are common contracted services. So if it's on the list, you're gonna um, go to the fund source and then put the amount you need for that fund source. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we do have residential set-aside um, listed on this list, so you can enter the set-aside um, for IDB formula or IDB preschool. Um, so let me go to the next section. At the end, if you don't see your contracts and services listed in lines one through 27, you can add other, and you can list your contracted services here and then you'll make sure that you provide a purpose related to special education. And then you can add more line items if you need more line items than one. And you can also delete items if you decide later that you do not need that. You can select this uh, little box on the left and hit delete item and it'll delete that item. Okay, so. The total professional and contracted services for IDEA B, let's say formula in part three, must equal the amount um, entered for this fund source in part one, line two, professional and contracted services. So let's say you've entered amounts in lines one through 27 and your total amount is 300. So now let's go back. You're going to have to enter that amount in line two here. So you'd enter 300 here, and it would take away from your remaining amount here. So we just wanted you to be aware of that, that it's probably best um, if you have professional and contracted services that require specific approval, that you enter them here, you get your dollar amount, and then you go back to part. Um, two line, I think it's part one, line two, and enter that amount, because this the system will total that amount for you down here, and you can put that up in part one, line two. Okay. And if you do not do the correct amount, the system will let you know. Once you save the form, 
it's going to um, tell you there's an error if this amount does not match what you've placed in line two for part one. Okay. Okay, now remember there's no 6,300 other op or, um, supplies and materials schedule. So the next schedule will be the BS 6401 other operating costs. So under this schedule, you'll have your um, out of state travel, travel for students, educational field trips, stipends. Um, if a fund source is not allowable, it's going to be grayed out, just like line five is grayed out here and line seven. So you'll know you can't put any funds in that um, area. Again, these are um, the amount of funds is what you'll list on this schedule. So you put the amount of funds. Um, if the other thing is any remaining budget amounts will display on line um, not requiring specific approval, which is this line here. So if on the budget summary you put um, $1,000 for 6400 it'll go to this section when you open up this application or the schedule. And then if you want amounts for out-of-state out of state travel or any of the others, it's going to take away from your remaining amount here. Okay. The other thing, patient to be submitted. So you'll want to, um, you can go to this website for approval documents, um, and it'll tell you what you need to submit for each, um, for each different line item. And then any remaining budget amounts will display on the line not required specific approval. So if you budget funds for 6,400 and you do not um, use all of the funds, the rest will re go in remaining 6,400. Okay. And then debt services will be the next schedule. It's the BS 6501. So in here, you'll put your costs related to a lease purchase. Now remember, capital lease interest is not allowable, so that's grayed out. So you'll only put your capital lease um, principal and capital lease debt. And if you do um, use this, sometimes the lease a bus or lease a portable building, um, then you'll need to complete part two. So you'll have to put in the program description and the contract has to be a two or three year agreement. It cannot be a single year. And the contract dates must include the school year. If it doesn't, once you save it, it's gonna give you an error message and let you know. So um, you'll select the property description the property value, the fund source, idea B formula, preschool or discretionary death, and the contract dates. And then if you have more than one, you're going to add an item. And then if you decide later that it's not necessary, then you can click on this left little button and delete the item. Okay. And then we have the BS 6601, which is the capital outlay schedule. This um, looks a lot different than last year. It's kind of flip-flop. Um, capital expenditures is on top in part one. So when you first go into this schedule, the capital outlay schedule, if you've put any funds on the BS 6001 budget summary, you're gonna see an amount in um, this section here, line three. Um, so if you have anything for line one or two, line one is library books or media, 
and line two is additions or improvement to capital assets, it'll take away from your amount in line three. Okay, so um, one thing to note is that if, um, uh, if you have anything for lines one and two, and you also have um, for library books and additions or improvements, um, just make sure if you have computers, software, any equipment, bus, anything for special ed, that you allow money for that on line three. Okay. So we're gonna go over, um, again, part two is for furniture, equipment, vehicles, or software, which is down here. So in this section, you're gonna enter a description and the number of units, quantity, and the fund source, IDAB formula, preschool, or discretionary def. And then you're gonna provide a brief description and how it will accomplish the goals of the special ed consolidated program. And one thing to note is if items are identified in part two, this section here, the amount budget on the um, budget summary must be greater than the lines one and two in part one. So that way it allows for the item down here. Okay. And again, you can add a line if you have a bus or um, something else, you can add a line to add more than one computers, all your equipment, vehicles, software. And then if you want to delete, you select the little X over here and delete item. Okay. And then the last schedule is the BS 6016, which is the fiscal compliance requirements schedule. And I'll go line by line on this schedule. Okay, so let's start with line one. So here you're going to enter the amount of state and local or local only special ed expenditures for the most recent prior year for which data is available and the LEA was in MOE compliance. And you can get this information from part two of the most recent IDEA B LEA MOE compliance review report. So that's what you put in line one. And remember, this is not your federal dollars. It's your state and local or local only dollars. Okay. And then line two, right here, enter the amount of state and local or local only budget for the special ed um, education for the current year. So. Um, the thing to remember is if you, in line one, you entered state and local expenditures, you, then you want to enter state and local expenditures in line two. And likewise, if you enter local funds in line one, you'll enter local funds in line two. And then later on in line four, that's where you'll assure that you use state and local or local only in lines one and two. Okay, and then line three, if the amount entered in line two is less than the amount entered in line one, then this justification section will open up and you'll select the appropriate justification and enter the budget amount. Now, the budget amount entered in line two plus the amount entered in line three must equal or exceed the amount you entered in line one. And if that is not the case, then the system will give you an error message. Okay. And then line four, as we discussed previously, 
should be either state and local or local only in line four. And you're just checking the box that is state and local or local only. Okay. And then something different that we've separated line five from the rest because this refers to voluntary MOE. So to be able to voluntarily reduce MOE, you must meet the um, three criteria, following criteria. The LEA must have an increase of idea B formula final amount from this year to last year. So it has to be an increase. The LEA must have a determination level of meet requirements that the program area will um, send you that information on if you meet requirements. And the LEA must not be identified as having significant disproportionality. So also the program will notify you if you're on that list. So as long as you've met those three requirements, then you can voluntarily reduce MOE. So let me explain this um, a little bit. Um, so when you submit your original application, every applicant must select one of the three options. So you must select one of these. So TEA recommends that for your original application that you select either one or two in the original application until final amounts are available. Then once final amounts are available, then you can determine whether you want to voluntarily reduce MOE. Okay, so one or two um, for your original application, and that doesn't require you to put an amount. So once um, final are available, usually around December, January, those become available, then you can select line three, which um, states that you want to voluntarily reduce and you put your dollar amount here. Okay. So if you select the third option, you will type in the actual amount of MOE reduction planned to be taken for the current year. If the actual amount of MOE voluntary reduction is not known when you submit the original application, you can estimate that amount. But it's very important that if you select the third button, put an amount, that when final amounts are available, you must amend. Um, by the deadline, which is September 3rd, the actual amount that you're going to voluntarily reduce. So we suggest that you select the first or second box in the original application, and then when finals in December or January are available, then you can go back and determine if you want to um, voluntarily reduce, because it's hard to remember if you put an amount in there in your original to go back and make sure that you still meet all the requir requirements. So. Okay, and then here's the CIS or um, CCIS, um, which is Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervening Services Requirements. So we have both of those, which is different from last year. We just had um, Coordinated Early Intervening Services. But if you're required to reserve the full 15% for CEIS funds, um, we now have the Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervening Services. So if you're required or if you decide to reserve CEIS funds for struggling non-disabled students, you'll select your name here from the down, down arrow. And then now, which is different from last year, is the maximum CEIS or CCIS amount will be here. So it won't be in this, um, when you select one, it'll, it'll be listed under max CEIS, CCIS reserve. And the system, once you save the application, will not let you go over the full 15%. So you'll enter the amount for CEIS in IDAB formula or IDAB preschool or both. 
And remember, it can be up to 15% um, to serve K through 12 students who have not been identified as needing special ed, but who need assistance. And that can be reserved for professional development, education, behavior evaluation services and support. So that's what that section is for. And remember to keep documentation. And then remember that LEAs that are identified with significant disproportionality are required to reserve the full 15% of IDEA B formula and preschool um, for struggling non-disabled students. And remember the full amount will be in this section maximum here. And program will send you a letter telling you if you need, if you're required to reserve that full amount. Okay. And then um, struggling students served with CIS funds must be counted and tracked on the SC 5100 CIS data form for, for three years. So it's very important that if you decide that you want to reserve CIS funds for struggling non-disabled students, that you keep documentation on hand for three years. Because um, this form will become available to you and it's under the special collections tab where we saw the SC 5003. That form will be available if you reserve CIS funds for three years. Um, another very important thing is if you determine later that you do not want to reserve CIS funds and you've had them in your application, you'll need to um, complete an amendment before the deadline to remove those CIS funds. So you would just click on the button over here and delete member district if you um, later determine that you do not need CES funds for struggling non-disabled students. Now, if you're on the required list to reserve 15%, that's not an option for you. Okay. And then the last box, part B, is you check the box that you have read and understood the CIS requirements and CCIS requirements. Now, um, what I'm noticing is we're getting a lot of calls that um, if you check this B here, it's asking you to complete the part two for CIS. So if you're not reserving funds for CIS, make sure you don't check this box. You do not need to complete anything in part two on the BS 6016. It's only if you're reserving funds for CES, struggling non-disabled students, do you complete part two. Otherwise, you save the form, the schedule, and you um, are done with it. Uh, if you check this box, you have to come back in and uncheck it, and you'll also have to remove the information in part one, or part two, by clicking on the box over here and delete member district. Another thing I wanted to uh, remind you of is if you're in SSA, you're gonna have lines one through four already listed for you for each, for the fiscal agent and the member districts. So that section will be listed for you. You just complete it for, the fiscal agent will complete it for, the, for themselves and the member districts. And then this part two, you'll complete if you hit click on the down arrow, if you need, if you have one member that you want to reserve CIS funds, um, it'll be there to select. Or if you're required to, it'll be in that down arrow to select also. But if you are not reserving CIS funds, do not complete any of part two. You'll have to remove, um, you'll have to click on delete member district and remove the check mark in part B in order to save the form without it being incomplete. Okay. 
And um, the other thing I just wanted you to be aware of, this is our contact information. This is regions one through 10. And our negotiators, um, you'll have your negotiator name and their, um, their information, re their region, and their phone number, and their email address. So um, this is regions one through 10. We've split it up for e-grants. So um, if you need to contact them at any point, they'll be able to assist you. And then I'll give you regions. Um, and also if I'm going fast, um, this PowerPoint, remember, will be on the website so you can look at your region assignment or give us a call and we can get you to your negotiator. And this is regions 11 through 20. We have the name, like here's my name, and the title, your, our title, and then the regions that we're responsible for, our contact information, and then our email address. So you can contact us to assist you anything with the special ed consolidated grant. And then I wanted to go over also, we have some resources that are great. Um, applying for a grant that gives you information on how to apply for any um, grants in TEA. And then we have the grant opportunities page. Remember that's a list of all of our grants. It'll tell you who's eligible. If there's an errata posted with a change in the grant, um, it'll give you all that information, the deadlines. This is a great resource um, with a lot of information. And then we have our e-grants link. Remember, it works best with um, Google, Chrome, um, and Internet Explorer. And the Edge, it does not seem to like. So Edge looks a lot like Internet Explorer. Remember, in an Internet Explorer has that little yellow um, circle around the E. So if you're in Edge, you're probably going to have issues with trying to complete the application. So we suggest that you use Chrome or Internet Explorer for e-grants. And then we have our entitlements page that will list all the entitlements for all the funding sources for the Perkins SPED ESSA grants. And then I've also included a link for Idea B Fiscal Compliance. That's for our BS 6016. We have Federal Fiscal Compliance and Reporting Division that um, pretty much owns that schedule. So they can help you with questions regarding that. And then our justification forms, which mainly relate to 6,400 other operating costs. This is where our justification forms can be, um, they'll give you directions on what to complete and who to submit that to. So if you need to submit forms, it'll tell you who to complete that, um, how to complete that and who to submit that to. Okay. And then we're gonna open it up for some questions. Um, Good afternoon, I am Tasha Clifton and I'm a unit manager in Grants Administration Division. And we are gonna try to work our way through the questions this afternoon. I hope y'all are having a great day so far. Um, Lori, we have a, I'm gonna start with um, BS 6016. Um, okay. So I don't know if you want to try to make your way over there. Sure. Okay. Our first couple of questions um, are related to line one. Can you repeat um, where the LEAs learn the information or the number for part one, where do they get the dollar figure? Sure. Um, they'll go to their, it's page two of the most recent IDB, IDEA B LEA MOE compliance report. So that's where they're going to get that information. And if you have trouble 
finding that information, our um, Federal Fiscal Compliance and Reporting Division, um, they can assist you with that because they, they're the ones who, um, they will do a validation on a certain number of LEAs and they'll determine if these numbers are correct in line one or two. So if you need assistance um, on further assistance, you can contact them and they can tell you exactly where to go. But it's page two of the most recent IDEA B LEA MOE compliance report. Okay, if we are required to reserve CEIS funds, where, where do we include this amount in the budget schedule? Okay, so you will not, this year, you will not include, include that amount in the budget schedule. You're gonna to wanna to document which class object codes you're gonna be using that for, and then you'll only complete that in part two of the BS 6016 fiscal compliance report. And let me go to that. So it's part two here. This is the only place you're gonna show us where you reserve funds this year for CEIS, struggling non-disabled, and if you're required to reserve the 15%, it's going to be in this section only, on this schedule only, nowhere else on the application. Okay, a couple of more questions related to CEIS. Okay. When will we get a letter from the program if we, receive, if we um, have significant disproportionality and are required to reserve CEIS? Um, that should be happening soon. Um, I'm not sure if anybody from program is available to tell when those letters will come out. I don't think Kathy's on here this morning or anyone okay. from her team. Okay. So. Yes, but then, that should be soon. We should, you should receive a list if you're on that pretty soon regarding <clears throat> since um, the application is July 1st the opening date or the beginning date of the grant, you should uh, receive information um, soon from the program. Okay, we had an answer from one of our attendees. They said that they have already received their letters. Okay. So, if so that would be if you haven't received your letter, you probably could assume that you're not on the list or you could contact our program area um, their number is 512-463-9414, and that's Special Populations, and you could ask for someone um, uh, regarding the CEIS if they're required to reserve the CCIS amount. Okay, this is another question that may be for Kathy, and I believe she said it on the last training, but for the life of me, I can't remember the answer. Um, when will the SC5100 be available? The SC5100 will be available after we um, complete um, the special ed consolidated. Once you complete that and certify that, um, the next three years you'll have to report. So they're not gonna require you, you have to report by the deadline. So if you reserve them this year, in 2021, um, the SC 5100 is going to become available sometime this year. Once they determine, they'll probably run a list and they'll determine who needs to reserve those funds or who needs to complete the SC 5100. So it's probably um, they notify those districts if they've completed that form, um, whether or not if they haven't completed the SC 5100, that they need to complete that. So it's more towards the end of the year. If you haven't completed that, they'll let you know that you must complete that. So we constantly watch that. If you reserve CIS funds throughout the year, then at the end of the year, we'll, um, we'll check to see who's reserved funds and we'll make you complete the SC 5100 at the and it's probably more towards um, probably March or April. 
And then um, if you decide you didn't want to reserve the funds, then we'll have you zero that out. But it's more towards the end of the grant that we check that to see who's reserved. And then if um, they're required to, then they'd be required to fill out the SC 5100. <clears throat> okay, we have a question related to um, BS 6201. Okay. If we need to move money later between services, will, will each line be subject to the rules regarding amendments? So yes. in the breakout, okay. Yes, so for, you'll put an amount, remember, in there. So if it's 25% of your total budget, or if you don't have any funds in that line item, then you'll need to amend. So you can always contact your negotiator. Um, if you think an amendment's allow, um, that you need to complete an amendment, and we can discuss that with you. But if you don't have that, if you have a contracted services that you determine um, requires specific approval um, and you haven't listed that, then later, then you'll need to amend. But um, there is, a, if you have like speech therapy and it's within 25% of the budget and it, um, the rest is gonna go in remaining, um, but remember it's the total budget of IDEA B formula, IDEA B preschool, or IDEA B discretionary deaf, then you will not need to amend, but it's best to talk to your negotiator to determine whether you need to amend or not. With that. <clears throat> While we are on um, BS 6201, mm -hmm. which area of the budget do you recommend putting the 25% set aside? Um, there's a line, it, it's line 22 is for residential set aside. So last year we recommended that you put it in 62 remaining. This year we've made a line item for it, line 22, residential set aside. So that would be the best place to put the residential set aside amount. Okay, I don't know if you need to reference the BS6401, but here's a question regarding out-of-state travel. Well, actually the question is regarding in-state travel. They are wanting to know where in-state travel should be budgeted essentially. Okay, in-state travel will go under 64 remaining. Other operating costs that do not require specific approval. So any in-state travel, you can just, um, on the budget page, you'd put it in 6,400 and then it'll populate the remaining 6,400 section. And that's where you budget for in-state travel. Okay, we have a question um, regarding the interrelatedness between SC 5003 and GS 2200. Okay. So between SC 5003 and the contacts page, will all districts in a special ed co-op have to complete SC 5003 and GS 2200 before the fiscal agent can submit the application? So we'll so, all... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to make sure you got that question. Okay, the SC 5003 is only going to be completed um, for, that's going to be completed not by member district or SSA. Um, that's going to be completed, you have to get together because it's going to com be completed for the um, ESSA, SPED, and Perkins grant. So there's only one schedule completed for the SC 5003. And that'll be related to all three grants. So there's only one schedule. With the GS 2200 applicant designation and certification form, all independents will have to complete it. Um, 
fiscal agents will have to complete it, and then the members of SSAs will have to complete it. So that's, they're different. Um, they're gonna have to each complete it for the SC, um, the ADC form, the SC, or I'm sorry, the GS 2200 will have to be completed for all independents, SSA um, fiscal agents and member districts, which is different than the SC 5003, which will be completed once for all three grants where you'll have to get together and discuss how you want to complete that. I, let's see. I am the fiscal agent of a regional day school program for the deaf SSA. Do I have to wait until all those members complete the ADC before I have access to the grant? Okay. Now for RDSPD SSA members, they will not complete the ADC. This is different from all others. Only the fiscal agent of the RDSPD will complete the ADC for themselves and all member districts because their entitlement for the fiscal agent and the member districts are all under the um, fiscal agent. So if you're a member of an RDSPD, you do not complete the ADC form, the GS 2200 for the special ed consolidated grant. It'll be only your fiscal agent that will complete the ADC. I, if we have a teacher that serves multiple campuses, would they be included under LEA or campus positions? Okay, that is up to your local education policy um, to determine whether it's um, which category it's gonna fall under. Um, there's no way for us to really know their responsibilities. And um, so that's determined by the local education policy, how you want to, which category it best fits into. And this one is related to PS 3502. Um, I think they're talking about 4A and 4B. Okay. It says your, your three to five year olds are counted on both part A and B. And that's a question. So are your three to five year olds counted on both part A and B? Okay. So it's three and five year olds for preschool, but line two is for public schools where line three is for private schools. So that's the difference. You've got to make sure that on line two, you're referring to the public schools that are counted from age five to three, or three to five, and then um, private schools on line three for age three to five. That's the difference. Okay, we have someone that is having trouble with their ADC, says that it's not allowing them to input two names. Um, you should be able to select two names from the drop down. The submitter information is going to populate on its own. If you need more assistance than that, please reach out to your negotiator. Yes. Um, Lori or any of our panelists, do y'all have the, um, does anyone know the email address to FFCR? Someone is saying um, if we could provide them with an email address to contact FFCR regarding those um, significant disproportionality letters because it's easier than using the phone. Okay. Um, yes, um, the address is compliance at TEA dot texas.gov and i'll put it in the uh mona if you could put it in the chat box as well thank you 
Thank now, you. if you're talking about the significant disproportionality, who's on, um, now remember, program will give you the list of who's on there, but um, FFCR is going to run um, to check. They'll run a little sample of lines one and two to make sure your numbers are correct. So it depends on what you're asking. If you want to know if you're on the list, you can contact program. But if um, the sample list where they'll check your amounts is by FFCR, our Federal Fiscal Compliance Division. Okay, we have a question about state diff and they just want to know where the state DEF budget is located. Okay, state DEF will be um, in an application. It'll be called the Special Ed Consolidated State Grant, and that'll be available, we're hoping, around August or September. So we'll have those fund sources available later in the year when um, those dollar amounts are available. Okay, I believe that is all the questions that we have for now. Um, I want to thank you all for attending this afternoon. Oops, let's see. Did another one just pop in? No. Oh. Nope. Nope, sorry. I want to thank you all for tuning in this afternoon, and I'm going to turn it over to Lori for additional closing comments. Thank you so much for joining us today and we just hope you're all safe and um, if you have any questions, please reach out to your negotiator. We'll get, um, we're here to help and we're excited for the new year. So thank you so much. We look forward to working with you this year.